Welcome to Comic Palooza Presents. I'm Brendan Lyles, host of Code 45 The Movie Podcast, and today we're having an in-depth conversation with horror author Preston Fossil. We'll be covering his work, industry insights, and the creative process that keeps his writing ghoulishly inspired. Hello, everybody. Allow me to introduce award-winning author, novelist, and screenwriter whose work has appeared in Rue Morgue, Screen Magazine, Cinedump, and Fangoria. His book, Our Lady of the Inferno, has been deemed one of the best books of 2018 by Bloody Disgusting and won the IPPY Gold Medal for Horror. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Preston Fossil. What's going on, buddy? How you doing, man? Oh, well, thanks. Uh, thank you for having me. Man, it's a pleasure to have you, dude. It's, it's honestly a huge, huge honor, man. Um, I gotta ask, like... For a horror author, your story seems like a uh, like a kid friendly coming of age story. Um, you know, all the days with you visiting a uh, Snuck's video store, the warehouse food market where you get to like rent stuff and see video games. Um, how did that humble beginning lead you to be a writer? Uh, you know, I, I've always wanted to be a writer. Uh, when I was six years old, our vice principal was going to be retiring. And they asked everybody at our school to write stories about why she was retiring, what was leading to her leaving the school. And I don't remember where I came up with this, but I wrote this story. There, there was this program at the school at the time called the Gold Slip Program. And if kids were seen doing like good civic acts or like helping one another out, then they would get these like literal gold slips of paper. And then you could redeem them for like toys and prizes and stuff. And oh, wow. so the, the, the story that I came up with was that the students were behaving too well and they were handing out too many gold slips and it was taking the vice principal too much time to tally all of them and it was costing too much money to buy the prizes to give away to the kids. So the vice principal TP'd the school and blamed it on the kids and used that as an excuse to discontinue <laughs> the gold slip program. And then they found out that she did that. And so the reason she was leaving the school is that she was on the run from the police now. Wow. And I, I don't know where I came up with this. And I turned this in and our, our teacher puts the, the teacher's assistant in charge and she leaves. And I'm thinking, oh, no, is this because of me? And then she comes back and she says, Preston, come with me to the principal's office. Oh. And I'm thinking, oh, man, you're in for it now. You shouldn't have written that story. You're done for. And my teacher takes me in and the principal and the vice principal are there. And my teacher sits down and she says, read this story. And I am terrified. I read this story out loud. Everybody cracks up laughing. They thought that was the funniest thing in the world. And I knew from that moment forward that I wanted to be a writer, that I had something in me. I had some kind of ability that caused a reaction in people. No, I'm, I'm glad you said that because um, I, I wanted to figure out how a snarky email in that same style like, actually caused all of this a snowball in motion. Yeah, yeah. So th this comes back around because, uh, you know, you were talking about schnooks and supermarket warehouse. And uh, so so I know that I want to be a writer, but uh, I, I need inspiration. I need ideas. And, you know, as a kid, I was always fomenting these stories in my mind. And, and a lot of them came from these trips to the video store. And uh, I think that this was kind of this common experience for a lot of people of my generation. They were old enough for their parents to let them kind of peruse the video store, but not quite old enough to rent everything they wanted yet. And <laughs> right. I would, it, yeah, yeah. And I would invariably find myself in the sci-fi section or the horror movie section, looking at the covers for these R-rated, PG-13 rated movies that I wasn't quite old enough to rent yet. And back in the 80s, they had just like the greatest cover arts and it didn't even yes. always, yeah, yeah. And it didn't even always have anything to do with the movie inside. Right. The people who were doing these these cover art designs were just so creative. And that was just so much for a fertile imagination to look at this and to come up with your own story about what was on those tapes. What were these movies really about? I wanted to ask about the, the email only because, like, uh, I guess it makes sense now because I didn't I didn't know that story about you in school that it kind of it encourages you to you know keep that same energy when you do like th this email because you, you saw an article right and it kind of made you feel a certain type of way and this is one yeah. of the only times I've, I've heard a story where somebody sent an angry email and something positive came from it yeah i, I wasn't even expecting that so uh so I, I knew from a fairly young age that 
making a career for myself as a writer was going to be fairly difficult. And uh, so my original career tack was uh, psychology because I came of age during that whole period of like police procedurals and silence of the lambs and like paperback books about FBI profilers. And I was super influenced by that. And so that's what I went to college for. I got my bachelor's in abnormal psychology and I was one class away from a biology minor. And oh. I, I really burned out at the end of college. I had been spending all these years just immersed in all this stuff about, you know, serial killers and crime and all of this sort of thing. And it was just really starting to get to me. And while I was trying to figure things out right after I got my bachelor's degree, I got a job working as an optician outside of Houston. Mm. And the uh, the eye doctor's office where I work subscribes to this uh, magazine called 2020, and it's all things eyewear. And one day we got some downtime in the office and I'm reading this article and I didn't really think it was that great of an article. I thought it kind of advocated dishonest sales practices. And I also thought that uh, it was just really badly written. And so I just do the snarkiest thing in the world. I get the editor's email address and I write to them and I say, look, with you know the, the dawn of online optical, people already think that opticians are trying to cheat them, that, you know, oh, I can go online and get a pair of glasses for $6. My eye doctor must be crooked that they're charging $100. And now you've got this magazine article that's kind of proving that by encouraging these dishonest sales practices. And, oh, right. by the way, coming from somebody with a background in English, it's just written really poorly, too. <laughs> And this was the snarkiest thing I did. I just must have been having a really bad day. I copy and paste an entire paragraph from the article into the email. And I like diagram it. And I like explain everything that's wrong with it. And so like, oh, you know, th this is phrased incorrectly. And like this part of speech has been used wrong and yada, yada, yada. And I send it off. And I figure somebody's going to read this and think, oh, this guy sucks. And then they're going to ignore it. And I'm never going to hear from them again. And a couple of weeks later, I get an email back from the editor. And he says, you know what? You're right. Uh, this didn't get reviewed as well as it should have. Uh, we're going to pull it from the online version of the magazine. And some things I'm very savvy about and some things just go right over my head. <laughs> and he says at the end of this email in this very catty way, oh, and if you think you can write so well, why don't you write for us? And it was complete sarcasm. <laughs> I thought he was being sincere. And I thought, oh, boy, they want me to write for them. So I sit down, I write an article, and I send it back to them. And I says, here you go. Here's your article. And the editor writes back to this. And he says, well, you know, I was, I was kind of being sarcastic, but this is really good. How would you like to write for us? Nice. And nice. That was, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was eight years ago. And I, I'm still writing for them part time. I uh, still have uh, recurring uh, articles pop up in 2020. I'm still on the masthead as a contributing editor. Nice. And uh, that was that was my foot into the door of professional writing. After 2020 Magazine, um, you had a chance encounter at a con, uh, much like Comapalooza, um, and it caused you to boldly approach a Rube Morgue table to like uh, do a pitch. What like what caused you to do that? Like what, what spurred you on to do that? So going back to Supermarket Warehouse, uh, mm -hmm. back in around 2004, when they started switching over from VHS to DVD, they were selling up VHSs for like nothing. I mean, you were able to go in there and walk out with an armload of VHSs for like five, ten bucks. Yeah. And I was bouncing around to Hollywood Video, Warehouse Market, all these different stores. And one of the tapes that I, I rescued from Supermarket Warehouse is this late 60s, early 70s British horror movie called Girly. Yeah. And it was uh, shot at Oakley Court, which is the same place they used as uh, Frankenfurter's Castle in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And at the time that I got this movie, I could not find out anything about it online it's like this thing might as well have been shot inside a bubble and the lead actress in it vanessa howard just walks away with this movie it's like she is convinced that she's getting the oscar for this it's like she does not realize that she is in a low budget like late 60s swinging london cash in horror film she thinks that this is going to be the thing that sweeps the oscars next year right. and i would just blown away by her performance and periodically i would google her 
to try and figure out whatever happened to her because she just drops off the map a couple of years after she makes this movie. And one day in 2012, I just randomly Google her name and the very first thing that comes up is an obituary. And it's very scant. It's like Vanessa Howard's uh, former actress died at the age of 62. And like, that's virtually it. Mm. And I'm like, well, wait, what? Because one, the last time that I could, the last record I could find for her was uh, in England in the 1970s. This obituary is running in uh, Hollywood, California. Oh, and there's there's also a line in there, uh, ex-wife of Rocky producer Robert Chardoff. And it's like, so oh. she, she stops making movies in the 70s. She marries the guy who made Rocky, divorces him and dies at 62. What's the story there? Right. And I'm at this horror convention, Texas Frightmare Weekend, the very next year, 2013. And I see that Rue Morgue Magazine is a sponsor for the convention. And something just clicks in my head. And I say to myself, you know, if you had the backing of a legitimate magazine, you could probably find her family, her friends, people who knew her, and you could write a story about her. And you could really memorialize her in a way that nobody has. And in the process, you know, solve this mystery and put together the pieces of her life. And at the time, the only journalistic background I really had was writing for 2020. And just completely on a whim, I go up to the table. I don't know who I'm talking to. I pull out my 2020 business card and I say, my name is Preston Fossil and I'm a writer and I've got a great story for you. And I lay out pretty much everything I just said to you. Right. And again, I'm figuring that this is kind of going to go into the ether. This, this guy's probably some intern that they've hired to work the booth or he uh, is somebody working for Texas Frightmare Weekend because Rue Morgue is based out of Canada. And I don't think mm. they're going to send their staff down to Dallas to attend this event. And the guy says, wow, that's a really interesting story. I don't know if it's quite right for us, but let's talk some more. And he gives me his business card. And it turns out to be Dave Alexander, who was then the editor-in-chief of Rue Morgue Magazine. He had actually come down there to run the booth for this convention. And I'm just amazed looking at this. I'm like, wow, I just pitched that to the editor of the magazine. And uh, That's insane look. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I would not have guessed. I I think I did a better job in not knowing that it was him. I think that if I had known this is the editor of the magazine, I, I might have choked. (laughs) Right, <laughs> uh, but uh, we uh, we ended up emailing back and forth, and he said he wasn't sure if that was quite the right story for them. That they wanted a little bit more of a contemporary focus in the magazine, but he said, you know, I love the way that you write your emails. I can tell that you're very passionate and knowledgeable about horror cinema, uh, and especially about retro horror cinema. How would you like to start writing reviews for DVD reissues, where the uh, these old re-releasing houses are putting movies back out on DVD? And I said, sure. And I started to uh, work on the reissues and worked my way up to doing interviews, blog content, feature articles, and uh, was a regular contributor to Rue Morgue from 2013 to 2017. One thing I've noticed about your creative process is um, you usually try to right wrongs or pick up uh, a ball that somebody dropped along the way. I'm talking about Venture Brothers. I'm talking about Dexter. And I'm talking about, uh, oh, my God, it was another show that screwed. Oh, American Horror Story. They all screwed up the Minotaur. Yes. Um, I I thought the idea of a minotaur killer was just such a really cool idea. I'm really interested in Greek mythology. I uh, really enjoyed uh, studying it in school. And then I noticed in quick succession, uh, like you said, Dexter, Venture Brothers, American Horror Story, all had these subplots with like minotaur killers. But all of them treated it like a joke. All of them was an afterthought. I mean, the, the Minotaur killer in Dexter was in the season where an evil district attorney was the big bad guy with Jimmy Smith. Yeah. And it's like <laughs> Minotaur killer with a apartment building lair versus Jimmy Smith who doesn't want to be Dexter's friend. And you go with Jimmy Smith, who doesn't want to be Dexter's friend, is the big bad of the season, and you get rid of the Minotaur in two episodes. I just, you know, I couldn't believe it. There's just such fertile creative ground there. 
And uh, like you said, one of my big inspirations for stuff is what did other people not succeed in doing? Where were balls dropped? Where were these big narrative holes left? What aren't other people doing? You know, what, what's the thing that we all want to see, but that nobody is putting out into the world? For the longest time, that was this big inspiration that was bouncing around in my head. I wanted to do a story about a, a minotaur serial killer, about somebody who thought that they were the minotaur. And that was the, the big inspiration for my debut novel, Our Lady of the Inferno. I get this picked up by a independent press. Uh, they're based out of Georgia. They've had one line of novels come out. They're getting uh, ready to release their second line. And they pick this up as one of the kind of flagship entries in the second line of uh, horror novels they're going to have coming out. You know, Rue mm. Morgue's Preston Fossil's debut novel. And so the book comes out. I sell like maybe 20 copies of it. And then they go out of business. Mm. Uh, and for anybody who's watching this, who is interested in going into the world of indie horror publishing, one big piece of advice that I can bestow upon you is be ready for that. Indie presses come and go at a constant rate. There are a handful of them who have really managed to uh, go the distance, who have been around for a while, but be prepared for the possibility that through, you know, human sin or economics or accidents, there is always the possibility that your publisher may unexpectedly go under on you and to have contingency plans in place for that. And to be very aware of the contract that you've signed, to be aware, you know, is there a clause in there for rights to revert back to you? Should the publisher go under? Uh, you know, just, just be prepared for that. Um, thankfully, I was in a position where I was able to get the rights to revert back to me and uh, I had appeared as an extra in a horror film whose parent company was also going to be publishing books. And I managed to get a copy of the book into the hands of the, uh, the president of the company uh, after I ran into him after we uh, got done with, with filming. And it mm. just so happened that my book had gone out of uh, print at the time and I was able to sell them on putting it back into print. I saw the cover of the reprint. And uh, I got to say, it's very eye catching. And I've heard that it actually caused sales just off the cover alone. With the yes. Reissue. Yes. And that's the, uh, insane. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the cover was designed by a graphic artist named Ashley Detmering. Uh, she is currently the uh, art director for Fangoria. And uh, she, she just did wonders with this thing. I, I am convinced that people saw this and bought it who maybe even haven't read the book. They've got this like propped up on a shelf somewhere <laughs> just to show off the cover art. It's and, snazzy cover art. I can't lie. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I just cannot say enough good about her as an artist. Um, she had me put together a lookbook for the book. Like how did I visualize the world of the book looking? And she asked, you know, she really sat me down and talked this through with me and said, you know, does the book have a color scheme? Are there certain colors associated with different characters? How do you imagine the environment looking? And she had me assemble all of these different images from the period, you know, it's set mm -hmm. in 1983, New York. And uh, she had me give her all of these different images that were either directly from 1980s New York or that mm. were these kind of stylized renditions of New York from movies of the period. And, you know, she put all of that together and then synthesized that through her imagination and through her artistic eye. And that's what came out the other end. Now, there's one thing I do want to ask you about uh, the, the setting of the book. Like uh, a lot of people have been saying that you are like very, very detail oriented and uh, portray a very realistic depiction, uh, depiction of New York. Have you actually been there, though? Because I know you're from here. Um, you were on the uh, Gallo go around over in the woodlands and stuff. Like yeah. you're from here. Like you're from yeah. here. So I'm, I'm trying to figure like, 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 like what, how much research was involved or how much uh, actually on the foot, you know, like boots on the ground type of uh, research were you doing for this book? The very first time that I set foot in New York was to accept my award for this book. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. I, w I, I have a, a long turnaround time on books. Uh, I, I tend to write a book every couple of years. And there's some authors that are able to just churn one out every year. For me, it's one maybe every five years. And uh, a component of that is the amount of research I put into it because I enjoy writing more uh 
I, I hesitate to say historical because I think you say historical and people are thinking like Victorian era, World War right, II. Right. Yeah, I, I like writing 1960s through the 1980s. Uh, and I want to make sure that I'm completely accurately depicting whatever era and area I'm writing about. And so I just put a ton of research into writing this book to make sure that it was going to be 100% accurate unless I made a choice for it to be inaccurate. Uh, if there was going to be something historically inaccurate in the book, I wanted that to be a conscious choice. Uh, so like, for example, early on in the book, uh, my, my heroine, she uh, is at the Port Authority bus terminal mm. and uh, she runs this kind of like Fagin Oliver Twist, like criminal enterprise that she cons girls who are coming into the big city and joining who are like literally fresh off the bus. And she's oh, walking wow. around the bus terminal looking for, you know, girls fresh off the bus to, you know, recruit into this criminal operation. And I needed to know, was there a coffee shop inside the Port Authority bus terminal in 1983 that she could take her to, or did they have to leave the bus stop and go someplace down 42nd Street to get coffee there? Because I wanted them to stay in the bus stop, but I couldn't have them stay if there wasn't really a coffee shop. And so right. I went out and found out, was there a coffee shop there? Um, every location in the book, even if I change the name, is based on a real location that the characters could have feasibly gone to in 1983 New York. Uh, all of the songs referenced in the book you would have been able to have heard on the radio or see music videos for on MTV in June of 1983. Uh, I wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything in here that was off. Uh, one of the only big things I changed was the weather. Because I, I tracked down weather reports for the week in June of 1983 that the book is set. And there wasn't really any rain, but I wanted there to be kind of these dramatic sequences set in the rain at a couple of different points. And I figured, yeah, forget it. Nobody's going to do that, that amount of research yeah. into it. <laughs> no, other than me. Uh, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but uh, nobody, nobody's going to read this and, and think, oh, it didn't rain that week. This guy's a liar. Our Lady of the Inferno does have an analog to me who's a much nicer character who is also <laughs> <laughs> who is who is also somebody who spends a lot of time in a movie theater. He's a right. uh, comic shop employee named Roger who's kind of my my main character's on again, off again boyfriend. Uh, my my main character in Our Lady of the Inferno, I I stole a lot of my wife from. And so a lot of the, the banter and the interaction between her and my analog in the book is really just the way that we are in real life. Oh, man, that's, that's really cool, man. Also, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly shocked about that backstory of the Shady Projections because you um, your, your wife was curious about the backstory of that guy. And you like wrote the short story for her, like for her anniversary gift. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, yeah, how did that go over, man? <laughs> <laughs> you loved it. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cause I had that, you know, I had that quarter million word story. I had that 250,000 page theater story. And right. uh, I never, I never ended up putting any of that into our lady, the Inferno, but I did want to do something with it. And so I was uh, submitting sections of it as short stories to my college's literary magazine because there were certain set pieces in the book that could, could, could kind of stand alone as their own self-contained short stories. And some of them featured my projectionist, Andy. And my wife regularly read the literary journal. She was a lit major and uh, she loved these stories. And how we met was she said, you know, I've got to meet the guy who's writing these stories. And she sought me out. That's, that's how we met. So, you know, she jokes around that she was my first groupie. <laughs> and uh, after we got married, she said, you know, Andy was one of my favorite characters in this. And I always thought that you could do more with him because he started out as this very minor antagonist who would pop up and do something kind of shady and then disappear. But he was never really a main character. He was never really a main bad guy. And she said, I just want to know more about this guy. And so for our second anniversary in 2012, I wrote her a short story that was his backstory and where he came from and why he was the way he was. And she absolutely loved it. And she's the one who encouraged me to expand it into something more. That's and awesome. that's where, yeah, that's where my second book came from, uh, Beasts of 42nd Street. 
uh, it was initially scheduled to be published in September, right. but going back to what I was saying before, if you are in the world of indie publishing, the world of indie horror publishing especially, there is a good chance that your publisher will go out of business. And right. unfortunately, that's what happened to me this past summer. Um, if I can impart some more advice onto anybody watching this, if you get a book published, especially if that book is a success, uh, Our Lady of the Inferno, you know, got great reviews. I won the uh, the Ippy Award, the gold medal for horror. Get an agent. Don't become complacent. <laughs> because my publisher told me, you write another book, we will print it. I was so excited. I, you know, thought, oh, you know, I've got a home here. I'm going to be writing books with this place for years to come. I never tried to get an agent. I never tried to get any kind of representation. I got mm. very complacent. And now there is no publisher. Um, the the very sad irony is that they were sending out Beasts of Forty Second Street for review, and people love this thing. Oh man, so it, was already, it was already a smash. All your panels, your first panel was amazing. By the way, I was very blown away how, how well you done that. Um, but you do voices, man. You do accents. So where's the audiobooks? When are the audiobooks coming, man? Like you should do this. <laughs> I uh, I left it to the professionals for the audiobook. Uh it was uh the rights to the audiobook were optioned by Encyclopocalypse, which is run by a fella named Mark Miller, who used to be Clive Barker's production partner. And wow. uh, Mark, yeah, Mark is now in the realm of uh audiobook uh adaptations. And uh, the cool thing about the forthcoming audiobook of Our Lady of the Inferno is that we got professional grade voice actors to do different characters. And so we've nice. got Barbara Crampton as Nicolette, the killer. We've got uh, Doug Bradley as the uh, Polish gangster. We've got Mick Garris as Nicolette's unsuspecting boss who slowly comes to realize that his employee is a serial killer. And mm. then we uh, also got a uh, professional voiceover artist named Gigi Shen. Uh, to do the narration and then we've got these this great crop of uh, up and coming young uh, voice artists to fill out some of the younger roles uh, kind of the idea that I had was that the adults in the book would be voiced by these horror luminaries and then the people in their teens and 20s would be voiced by undiscovered talent and nice. so we've got this nice division between new and uh, old young up and coming uh, so it kind of covers the spectrum uh, I forgot one name. Uh, Izzy Lee. Izzy Lee. She is a fantastic short film director, and uh, okay. she also provided some voices to the book as well. Oh, good. Uh, good, good, good. She, she was a later addition to the project. Like we really rapidly cast a lot of people in the beginning, and so those are the names that really stick out for me. Uh, but Izzy Lee is also going to be a voice in the book, and uh, it's actually in post production right now. Uh, COVID. Awesome put a really big uh, damper on our production time, but it's really a matter of any day now uh, as soon good, as we finish the, the audio post-production. But look, man, I appreciate you so much for your time. Uh, seriously, it's been an honor to talk with you, man. It's been so much fun. Um, been, yeah. like, honestly, the, the biggest gift you gave me is the movie Girly because like, I watched it. Uh, the fact that she literally disappeared off the face of the earth is like a crime against humanity. And the fact that you did the memorial for her is like probably like the coolest things and the best things you could have done for her, man. So thank you for that, for getting the word out for her. Um, thank you for this book. I'm actually looking forward to getting this book. I, I, I'm going to buy it because oh, thank uh, you. Uh, just the premise alone and like, and, and what, what was behind the premise, the anger of people screwing it up was very, very important to me. Um, but please, like, any other projects you have coming up? Like if you want to plug anything, now's the time, sir. Um, hopefully in the near future, you'll be reading Beasts of 42nd Street. Uh, if you would like to read my uh, bi biography on Vanessa Howard, that is in an issue of Scream magazine. Uh, that's S-C-R-E-E-M because there is an S-C-R-E-A-M. And I always think that it's issue 34, and that's probably not right because I am not a math major. I am you know, very firmly in the world of literature. Do not ask me to do anything with numbers, even when it comes to my own work. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, keep your eyes out for uh, Beasts of 42nd Street. Uh, check out Our Lady of the Inferno. And uh, thank you for watching this. Don't forget to hit that like button. Leave a comment below to tell us what you enjoyed the most about this episode. Listener feedback is important to us, so let us know what you think. If you want to watch videos like this and more on topics related to pop culture, click the subscribe button below and ring that bell icon to get instant notifications, too. Thanks for watching Comic Palooza Presents. Stay tuned.